I'm Sue Lanthorpe. I've worked extensively in remote areas of Australia, uh, quite a lot in Queensland. My first community I ever worked at was Doomagee, and I've worked in most of the Cape York communities from Harakoon, Kalnyama, um, all over, as well as three years in the outer islands of the Torres Strait. And I've worked in Central Australia in about six or seven remote Aboriginal communities. So all my work has really been remote with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. The main differences between working in remote and the urban is your role. As a remote area nurse, it's very advanced practice um, and you get to do things and uh, it makes you think. As a nurse, the buck stops with you. So you really are working at, at a higher level, a more advanced level. The other area that is different is the need. Um, the need in remote Indigenous communities is huge and the difference one person can make is huge. Um, and that's very attractive, that, that you can make a difference. The other ones is uh, the cross-cultural aspect. Um, you can go through a period of culture shock where you don't really like that other culture for a period of time. But when you work through that culture shock, you get to the stage of, it's, it's such a privilege working and learning about another culture. The other main difference about working in remote areas is you see parts of Australia that you would never see. Uh, I've worked in the outer islands of the Torres Strait, some of the most beautiful places in the world. Um, and the coastal areas and the central Australia is amazing. The landscape, the people, everything. And really you don't get to go to those places or learn about them unless you're actually working there, which, which is rare. Three key things I would tell uh, someone before they go to work in a remote community is one, to do their research, to find out what's available, what's not available, where they can get their food from, um, what are the main health problems in that community. It can be very different from the top end to the central Australia. Um, really find out as much as they possibly can. The second one is to be prepared, probably more if they were going there for a job rather than just a placement, but to be clinically prepared for that advanced role, to maybe get a bit of experience in PEDS, uh, in A&E, uh, in a variety of different roles, so that they actually feel like they know what they can do. And as far as prepared, I do think people need to do some education or, or um, yeah, even short courses or a longer course for, uh, to be prepared for that advanced role in remote health. The third one, which I think is essential for everybody, is to have a, their own self-care plan. And we really encourage people to actually sit down and write it out. Uh, what can they do to, as a stress reliever, reading, um, walking, uh, have good contact with their friends and families? Internet is really important. Occasionally that's not really available in remote, but it's more and more available. And to write out what they're going to do, how, you know, when they're going to need a break, what, what can they do to maintain their sanity in a, in a remote area? I mean, there's a lot of pluses, but it's, it's a hard job. Uh, so they really need to do that self-care. And also know when they've had enough, either when they need a break or they need to leave. Um, I think that's really important. When I was in uh, working on York Island in the Torres Strait, where the youth orchestra came up, and it was a special program with the government, and they flew in on one of those army planes where they could land on short strips, um, and they had a feast for the kids with, you know, turtle and food. Some of the kids weren't really too um, excited about. And the chairman kept on coming up and go and tell them, go and tell them what it is, go and tell them what it is. Um, and then they set up the orchestra in the basketball courts on the sand and they played. And the whole community came out and sat round on, on the sand uh, to listen to the kids. And they just enjoyed it so much. And they made them play uh, La Bamba about four times. 
uh, which the kids thought was pretty hilarious. And then the teacher was going, oh, we've got to get the kids to bed, they've got to get up early in the morning, and the community wasn't having any of that. They um, got the kids up and they decided they should teach them some of their culture and some of their songs and dances. So they got all the kids sitting in a big circle with the Islander kids in between them, uh, and they taught them how to do a sit-down dance, which I still can do a little bit of. It was na 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 Anyway, you get the picture. Um, and the kids, they both sides enjoyed it so much and it just broke down all the barriers. And I can remember when I was in Cairns, I listened to a radio and it was the woman who ran the youth orchestra and she was talking about the trip they did. And she said the highlight was York Island. Uh, and the people on York Island have always remembered, they've loved that music and they love the orchestra. And for many of the people there, it's the first time they've actually heard it. So. Uh, it, was, it, it was just great, and I wish more of those sorts of things would happen. Well, probably the first one was being out at Doomagy and not really realising that places like that existed. Um, you know, that was when Bjorki Peterson was still in power in Queensland, and the oppression was amazing. Um, you know, the, the, I think the last discriminatory laws had just been removed from the Queensland legislation, but the people were so uh, oppressed and there was a feeling there was a lot of white people there who ran everything. Um, this was in the early 80s. And there was a strong sense about many of the white people that Aboriginal people couldn't do things. They just weren't intelligent enough or um, capable enough. And I was really shocked at that. But also, I think over time, um, and maybe it wasn't just one instant, but it was learning mainly from Aboriginal people and Torres Strait Islander people, that I got brought up as in Cairns, which is, was fairly racist when I got brought up, um, and then became realising that I carried some baggage. And it was being challenged and taught by Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people that I really respected, that made me reflect on myself. Um, and I try really hard not to, to recognise when any racist thoughts come up. But also I, I spend quite a bit of time now with, at university teaching people and one of my main areas I teach is about racism and how it works in society. And I guess the aha moment is, I'm not sure exactly when it happened, but I recognised how racist we were in Australia towards uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people. And I've worked against that, trying to do something about that. And education is the key, I think.